Welcome everyone to Now You See TV. You are watching the Midnight Ride hosted by David Carrico and I am John Pounders. David, what's up? Well, I am honored once again to be on the Midnight Ride. We're going to be taking our listeners once again into the midnight hour and we've got a fantastic subject tonight. We're going to be talking about ancient technology. This is just a wonderful subject that is going to get so much discussion on the table. It's one of these things that we can really think about, and it just causes you to think about so many things. And I think it's very, very biblical. In the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a scripture I believe applies to this subject, in uh, chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. And I think that certainly applies to our subject tonight. And we're going to be exploring a topic that I know you've done a lot of research on. And we're going to be entertaining the idea that there was indeed an ancient antediluvian civilization, and even older, that was as advanced or more advanced than our civilization today. So with no further ado, John... Take us on the midnight ride, and let's talk about ancient technology. All right, man, and I appreciate you you doing this show tonight. I did a recently did a a teaching video on it was a presentation that I had for the Austin conference um, about it was entitled "Ancient Watchers: Corruption, Chaos, and Knowledge," and um, it was it, it was took me down a lot of roads on this path of studying this stuff, but it also brought a lot of pieces of the puzzle together. And and me and David both have done quite a bit of research on this. So I, I think me bringing back some of the information that I shared that night, plus a little bit more, and then David having to add to this will be an exciting show for the listeners. So um, I, I, get, I guess I'm going to share, uh, I got a few slides for you guys to share, and I'm going to share these with you guys and kind of get us started on this. And David's going to interject at any point when he wants, because this is, um, this is interesting. So I hopefully let me know if you guys can see my uh, screen share here. Can you guys see this, the slideshow? Can you see this, David? Yes, I can. Okay. So Enoch 10 eight starts out and it says the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel to him ascribe all sin. And so we know obviously that this is a very weighty judgment. Um, and many people would think, you know, what in the world did these guys do to be ascribed all sin? But if, as we, as we continue um, in Genesis six, it says, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men, that they were fair and they took them wives, all which they chose. And Yahweh said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after, when the sons of Elohim came into the daughters of men, and they build, bear children to them, the same became mighty men, who were of old men of renown. And when you see this verse for the first time, and I remember when I saw it for the first time, I was shocked, because I mean, I, I had read the Bible before, I had actually been told that this was talking about Sethites, the sons of the Seth. And I just kind of took it for what it was. You know, I went to Christian school pretty much my whole life, went to church uh, before I, you know, basically went into the world. And I don't know how many times I passed over this verse with not a, not another thought. But as soon as I became a believer and sat down and read the Bible for myself, this verse, these verses jumped out at me. And so we see that these sons of God have come down and they've created giants and the narrative continues in the book of Enoch. And in the last teaching that I did, I gave the reasons why I believe the book of Enoch to be valid. Um, because, and, and I, I'm not going to go over those again tonight because I, I believe that, um, if you want to, you can always go back and watch it. Also me and David have done a, um, 
video commentary on the book of Enoch. We're not finished yet. We're, I think we're in chapter 10 right now. And we're going through verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And that is on our subscription network. But we've gone and we've given a lot of reasons why we believe that the book of Enoch is inspired and is true. Uh, also, you know, you when you look at mythologies around the world, you see that this story is not just in the Bible or in the book of Enoch. This story is with every ancient civilization in the world. There's none that do not have a story very similar to this. And um, in we see 200 watchers in the, in the book of Enoch that uh, descend to Mount Hermon. And Enoch chapter 7 says, And all others together with them took unto wi themselves wives, and each chose for himself one. And they began to go into them and defile them, defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. And we see a lot of this stuff. Dave, me and David talked about it in pretty detail. Uh, some of the things that we're talking about here, herbal magic and uh, cutting of roots, charms, uh, enchantments, which we see in almost every mystery religion today. Uh, and, and it says in chapter eight, Azazel taught men to make swords, knives, shields, and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth, the art of working them, and bracelets, ornaments, and the use of antimony and the beautifying of eyelids and all kinds of costly stones and color tinctures. Um, and it says, And there arose much godliness, and they committed fornication and were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways. Simyaza taught enchantments and root cuttings, Amoros, the resolving of enchantments, Baraquil, astrology, Coco Bell, the constellations, Ezekiel, knowledge of the clouds, Eriquel, the signs of the earth, Shamziel, the signs of the sun, and Seriel, the signs, course of the moon. And they perished, they cried, and their cry went up to heaven. And, you know, as, as we know that a lot of these things we see in everyday life, I mean, there, this is almost considered, you know, science. This is considered scientism. This is considered... Uh, much of what we know about astronomy, occultism, and all of those things. And, and then a lot of these things that they taught were things that man were not supposed to know. The bu book of Enoch says in, in chapter 69 that men were not supposed to know all these things. All they were supposed to do is to give glory to the Father and to obey his commandments. And, and as we see, uh, we've gone down the path of the knowledge of good and evil. We've gone down these paths of trying to find a way to better uh, ourselves and all actually create ourselves into being similar uh, to gods. And we see that a lot with what we have going on today. So um, also according to the book of Enoch, uh, we see that um, they made themselves look like animals. It says in here in chapter 19, and you all said to me here shall stand the angels who have connected themselves with women and their spirits assuming the many different forms and defiling mankind, and they shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons as God uh, until the day of great judgment they shall be, uh, in which they shall be judged till they are made an end of. And so, in all, and obviously in every ancient civilization, we see uh, these exact things taking place. You know, we have right here, I've got a bunch of pictures of Horus, Set, Thoth. All of them look like animals pretty much. And we got Sobek, Ra, uh, they're all mixed with these things. And of course, we know that at the same time, there were they defiled beasts and, and animals as well as humans and created hybrids and such uh, like that. And so uh, one thing that I wanted to bring up that I didn't bring up in the last show that I've been doing a little bit of research on, uh, we have records of bones being discovered of humans that would stand or human hybrids of sorts that would stand up to 30 feet and weigh more than a, more than a thousand pounds. And uh, one of the best proofs I have best proofs that I have uh, just to give an example of ancient giant findings is the giant ape man. And um, so according to numerous newspaper articles that are written in 1934, a giant ape-like skeleton measured 32 feet in length was discovered in Jubalpur, India. Uh, there's there's a few different news archives that cover this story. Uh, I really like the website, The Trove, because it goes through. You can find archives from all the way back to the 1800s on newspapers. And, of course, I've found many other archives that have to do with giants found in America, giants found all over the place that are in many, many newspapers. But this one, the reason this is interesting 
Um, and, and we have different, here's the different ones. Here's one in Australia, the, the West Australian, and then Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, and there was others like the Times that had covered it as well. And the, the interesting thing about it is um, the um, there's an ancient Hindu Sanskrit god, I guess a giant named Hanuman. And he looks, he has an ape-like face and he's the leader of a group of forest dwellers. And um, at the temple of the Papakshi, there's a giant footprints that are more than four feet long. Um, and, and then if you do like, a, there's a website where you can do a height to foot ratio. So basically you can measure a foot size and then it should be able to tell you the height of the individual. And if you do that, it'll give you the height of 30 foot tall. And so this is, this is believed by the people there that this is the giant footprint of Hunaman, which is the picture that I showed you guys earlier. I'll go back to that. This is Hunaman. He's got an ape-like face and kind of a human-like body there. And I, just to give you guys a comparison to see how tall this 30-foot uh, giant would have been, is I, I'd made this little graph, and, and the graph is is two scale. So this would be a 30-foot um ape-like giant there on the right. And then you have Aga Bashan, which a lot of people would say is about 18 feet tall. And then you have Goliath that's 10 foot tall, which looks like a midget compared to Aga Bashan and also a midget compared to this, this giant skeleton. And then you have an average man, which I don't know that the average man's six foot, but I just did a six foot one because of the even number. Um, and you see this scale of this massive, massive, um, Thing that they would have there and a lot of the locals believed that that skeleton that they found uh, was the skeleton of Hunaman and uh, so this is an interesting thing and, and obviously the skeleton is nowhere to be found and at the time India was an English province so um, we know many giant skeleton cover-ups have been documented I mean the most recent Lovelock cave they had a giant skeleton in there a giant head uh, skull in there that you could view up till not too long ago before they confiscated the skull. And uh, there's hundreds, like I said, hundreds of newspaper articles telling the story of giant skeleton findings uh, that go way, way back. I mean, to the 1800s first for the first people that came here. And then obviously we have uh, Indians, American Indians, Native Americans um, that tell the story of these beings and being able to find their giant bones, etc. cetera. So um, basically every ancient mythological story mirrors the tale of these entities and these and their children of these entities. David, is there anything you wanted to add before uh, I go any further into this? Well, just recently in the very area where Hunaman is located, this uh, these relics and things, there was the tribe that is in the mountains in this very area to this day that's practicing cannibalism. And this is the tribe that the CNN reporter actually ate the human brains of another human being from a human skull live on CNN. The very same area. And all of the traditions of the giants show that they're cannibals. So, you know, I think we can still see vestiges of this to this day. Right. And India, you know, I'll, I'll be going in a little bit about India, but India has so many monuments to these these uh, deities or these um, Nephilim all over the place. I mean, you can't go anywhere in India without seeing these things. And they, they pay quite a bit of homage to these entities. And um, obviously, uh, India has preserved its mythology or what they call, they don't believe it's mythology. Obviously, they believe it's um the real deal here so let me get back to screen share here I'm yeah and it was done in a ritual to the goddess Shiva the destroyer which is even more troubling if that isn't enough troubling enough on its own that's exactly right let me get back to this sh this here so we're going to I'll tell you what man I, I, lo I love PowerPoint now I used to not know what I, I still don't know what I'm doing on it but hey you're getting to cool. be an old pro now you're getting good uh, I am getting good. I'm getting better at it. Let's put it that way. It took me forever to do my first presentation, like hours, and I'm like, I think 20 hours. Is good. So, <laughs> yeah. 
So, um, and it, so if we move on to Enoch fifteen eleven, it says, "And the spirits of the giants afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work destruction on the earth, and cause trouble. They take no food, but nevertheless hunger and thirst, and cause offenses. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men, and against the women, because they have proceeded from them." And so we are seeing this today in this day and age. Obviously, there's no. A shortage of people being oppressed by these spirits, uh, people being possessed by these spirits. And also uh, we will go on to see that they're doing just more than just that as well. And, um, and this is something David can expand on, but Ephesians chapter six warns us to put on the home or God. And it tells us that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, powers against the rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness and high places. And David went on to talk, and these are some of the words that we're talking about here. Uh, the exousia was uh, authority, influential power. The power of his who will and commands must be submitted to and obeyed. One who possesses such authority, a ruler, spiritual being superior to humans. And then we have thronos, one who's sitting on a throne, and we have ark, ruler, principality, or magistry. And then we have archon, a ruler, commander, in chief. Uh, we have pneumaticos, which is belonging to a spirit being, and we have epiranios, the heavens thing, the heavens things that exist or take place in the heavens, which David will be able to expand on that. And cosmo craters, which we have here, the Lord of the world, Prince of the Age, Satan, and Curitos, the dominion, power, lordship, and one who possesses dominion. And David, if you would, man, I really want to hear again. Uh, the Pleiades uh, explanation that you gave, because this is very interesting and valid to a lot of what I'm going to share here tonight. Yeah. And the, the Pleiades comes into play again when we discuss uh, ancient civilizations and it just seems to keep coming up and coming up. And in the text, you just read the word Cosmo Crator. This actually refers to, to heavenly luminaries as we would see them in the night sky, which we're beginning to rethink. We've uh, begun to question and reevaluate what we've been told about what these heavenly lumina luminaries are. And we've now come to understand that the Bible means what it says, that these are stars and other objects that are being moved by angels, that the stars are actually angels. And in, uh, I know a book we were talking about the other day, uh, The Fingerprints of the Gods by Graham Hancock. And in this book, uh, it really, as I was going over it again, some of my notes uh, for the show this afternoon, he made the statement that the Pyramid of the Sun, the, the, the Great Pyramid at Giza and the Pyramid of the Sun, uh, just south of Mexico City, they both use the mathematical equation pi in its construction. And of course, this wasn't supposed to have been known at that time. And also, the pyramid of the sun in Mexico is laid out in relationship to the con to the Pleiades. So over and over again, the Pleiades comes into view. And in the Golem, we did the Golem show just Thursday night, and it opened up with the rabbi looking at the Pleiades. So there's a universal understanding that the Pleiades was a source of dark power that they would try to draw down. And witches will talk about drawing down the moon. And there's uh, deliberate attempts on people in the dark side to access this power. And by the actual layout of these ancient monuments, it can be seen that he understood these things. And um, this is just becomes more and more evident as you study this and you look at what the Bible says. And when you dare to take the Bible literally, like in the word Cosmo Crater, and what stars really are, it just becomes extremely validating of Scripture. And Scripture and true science and true archaeology and true history really come together in such a deeply fascinating way that it is just blessing beyond belief. 
Yeah, and, and if I know you did a teaching on this, and you're going to be doing a teaching on this at the conference coming up, the um, mm -hmm. Take on the World Conference, and I'm excited about it because I've already got to hear it, and man, very interesting stuff. There's there's no doubt about that, and also in Scientism Exposed too, you you're going to be talking about this stuff as well. We've already filmed for that, and I'll be filming some of this stuff that we're going to be talking about tonight for that as well, so interesting stuff. So anyways, I'm going to move on here. Um, to this next part here. So there's obviously we know that entities are communicating with humans and there's different ways that they go about that. Uh, but we learn uh, in craft legend that these entities um, communicate things that are of value to humans. And we look at here, this quote uh, from, uh, Plato, yeah, that's what I got up, Plato, and it says, the gods don't communicate to mortals directly, but intermediary spirits, so mortals need figures to communicate with the gods, and thus the daemon, or demon, becomes the figure needed of the petition, a source evolving into sacrifices, initiations, incantations, prophecies, divinations, magic spells, and sacred poems, and I'll, 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 show a couple more quotes here and this is from Anton LaVey uh, that's telling people to keep themselves open to demons who whisper in your ear and the old meaning of demon used to close used to closer to muse uh, guiding inspirational spirit and I'll be talking about the muses and stuff like that here in a little bit because it's very interesting uh, what we gather from that and then obviously Aleister Crowley um, one of the most wicked men in the world and he was a very devoted Freemason and Satanist. And he wrote and practiced about human sacrifice, uh, sex magic, alchemy, um, Kabbalah. And he, what was the quote, David? He has enough Freemasonic metals that it could uh, yeah, bear down said, an element. Uh, he said that if he would put all of his Masonic metals on at one time, it would be enough to make an elephant stumble. Hmm. That's a lot of metals. And it looks like in this picture, he, he has quite a few metals there as well. And um, so we, we, one of the things that he did, uh, which is very interesting, he did something called the Amalahantra. All, I, I never can pronounce this right. Amalantra workings. And um, so we have the Babylon workings that were fashioned after his uh, workings. And he, they were there's three men here on this picture and I'll explain a little bit about them, but the Babylon working, which is spelled differently than what we see Babylon as. And that's them that do that. that I didn't misspell it. They actually spell it that way. Uh, but that began in 1945 and 19 and ended in 1946. And it was about a few months before Crowley's death in 47. And um, just prior uh, to the, uh, it was just prior to this wave of, unexplained UFOs and uh, aerial phenomena, ph phenomenon um, and it's in the place called the Great Flying Saucer Flap. Um, and most people know of this entity, uh, Lamb, that Crowley, Crowley supposedly made contact with in 1919 uh, through a series of rituals called the Amalantra Workings. Uh, Crowley said he sealed the portal um, and this is one of the entities that he had communicated with. And um, Jack Parsons, uh, most people probably have heard the name. He was a jet propulsion scientist who he was also um, a disciple of Crowley and then the leader of the OTO uh, at, at, after Crowley had, you know, kind of passed on the torch to him. Uh, but he performed... Uh, practice and perform rituals called the Babylon working and it was patterned after the pattern after what Crowley did and he opened this portal they were trying to get this the spirit of the whore of Babylon um, and he instead of flying saucers instead flying saucers and gray aliens infiltrated the earth uh, because he couldn't figure out how to close it. and it's what's another thing's interesting I know some of you guys have seen my teaching on mystery Babylon um, shortly after this is when Israel became a state again in 1948. And I don't know if there's a connection there or not, but they were trying to pull this whore of Babylon out and put it into a woman. And um, so who knows? But anyways, they um, this character, Lamb, 
that Curly drew, it, he claimed uh, he claimed to interact with it, and you know it looks just like a gray alien. And after that, uh, there was a cult formed by Kenneth Grant called the Cult of Lamb, and um, UFO sightings have increased ma drastically. I mean, you can see in just in the world today that we have massive amounts of alien encounters. Uh, we have Area 51 that formed. Um, in the last teaching I did, I showed a video from Fox News that talked about the, stati the statistics of UFO sightings. And um, I'm not really sure if that's what they did, but it does seem like right after this, uh, a lot of these things happen. And of course, we here at NICTV don't believe that they're actual aliens. We believe they're demonic entities. So um, because a lot of these alien abductions phenomenons and these uh, UFO sightings and when people are oppressed by these entities, that using the name of the Messiah, using the name of Jesus or Yeshua has stopped these visitations and actually caused these entities to flee uh, away from that. And and some of you guys know Joseph Jordan. I've had him on Now You See TV before. And he's a field investigator for MUFON, which is a mutual UFO network, which is the largest um, UFO network in the world. And he's also the co-founder of C4 Research Group. And he stated in a video I showed in my other presentation, which I'm not going to show tonight, but he, he, um, after he became a believer, he used this on, um, a person or and used this on a, a in for, in on, on a person. He asked this person to use this when they were having their abduction scenarios and it stopped the abduction scenario. And when he decided to tell his peers about it and, they basically said they've heard about it before and they knew about it, but they didn't want to bring it out because it was basically quote hurt their business. And, um, if you guys want to see the rest of that presentation, like I said, I had that on there, but I don't know that we'll have time to play the video right now. Plus I don't have any way for you guys to hear the audio cause I'm doing the show from my house right now. So, um, another guy that kind of came out of all this thing was L Ron Hubbard and he's the founder of the largest cult in the world. I mean, Scientology is massive and he was part of the workings and he was a friend of Jack Parson and he lived with Jack Parson at the what they called the Parsonage and uh, shortly after that he wrote Dianetics and Scientology I don't know if you guys have seen that documentary um, series that Lena uh, Leah Romini I believe is her name uh, she's somebody that came out of Scientology she's famous she used to be on King and Queen she was the wife on King of Queens and she, um, she came out of it. And also, um, I can't remember the guy's name or I believe it's like Ron Miscavige or something like that. He came out of it and he was like the enforcer of Scientology. So they basically been traveling around the world, um, interviewing people that have come out of it and had some serious consequences for being a part of this Scientology, but a very multi multi billion dollar cult, uh, that this guy started shortly after this whole thing. And David, did you have anything to add to that before I go on to, I'm, I'm after this, I'm going to kind of go on to the writings of the watchers through the Vedic texts and stuff. Well, everything that you're saying makes perfect sense. And from the text of Enoch, it specifically states that this type of knowledge, fallen angel technology to coin a term or to use the term, was communicated from fallen angels to mankind. And we see this from the statements that you brought forth from Crowley and LaVey, that they all claim to be receiving this revelation from dark spirits. And indeed, these workings open gates, and that's why they do them. And I believe that there were significant gates opened in the 1947 to 48 era that has increased this paranormal activity and why would it be strange for us to make the claim that there is definite uh, fallen angel technology being transmitted to the leading scientists and governments of the world right now and that it's not just being transmitted but it's being actively sought by these individuals uh, it would uh, you know from what we know, this is exactly what we should expect to be happening. No doubt. And I, and I, th I think later on the presentation, I'll show proof that this is happening. 
um, because they don't make any qualms about it and they don't hide it. I mean, of course, the average person's not going to look into what the everything that they said, and this is not a common um, topic amongst scientists, obviously, or amongst uh, your average TV show. But this, they definitely um, claim this stuff, they believe it, and they act on it, and we see it. So, uh, and this is the claim of the Nazis, the Nazis who had unbelievable advanced technology coming out toward the end of World War II, they openly claimed that they received this knowledge for the designs of the V-2 rocket and some of their other uh, machines that they made directly from fallen beans. I mean, they made this claim. So it's out there. It definitely is. And so we're going to go into one of the texts that I believe is probably one of the most prominently um, watcher texts. I mean, this has information on health, technology. Um, just, I mean, you name it. It's got a wide variety of things, uh, you know, health practices, um, building practices. And we know that the watchers top men to write and gave them books. There's a lot of people saying that men could not write uh, that long ago, but I would definitely beg to differ. I mean, you look at the Kodo Hammurabi, you look at all these ancient um, tablets that have been found that are definitely older than what common, I guess, common uh, paleontology would claim that men were able to write. And um, this scripture, the Vedas, and even if they couldn't write back then, they definitely passed down this information verbally. I mean, we know that there is um, oral traditions in almost every every civilization. So uh, the 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 first one I guess I'm going to bring up is uh, the only one tonight that I'm going to bring up is the Vedas. And and some of you guys saw me talk about this before. And the Vedas are interesting because they contain um, ancient, ancient, probably the most ancient texts that we can find. And they were it was actually composed by the Aryans. Um, and I didn't go into a lot about the Aryans in the last show, but basically Aryan civilizations go back to Armenia and Armenia is probably the most ancient civilization that we've been able to find as paleontologists. Um, I'm not that I'm a paleontologist, but, uh, according to, you know, the, the professionals is one of the most ancient civilizations. And I would think that might me personally, I believe that it is, um, post-Diluvian civilization. I believe there were more ancient ones at, before that, uh, such as I believe that the pyramids and different locations like that were even older. But these, uh, this, there was an ancient civilization there. And we know that from a lot of, a lot of people believe that the Ark is where that was landed. That's where Noah and his generations were from. Um, also, we have the oldest map of Babylon located in Armenia. And so we have um, the, basically that whole civilization there would have been uh, where the, where the um, Anakim and the um, Babylonian civilizations ran by Nimrod were located. And so these texts were uh, originally Aryan, but the, the Indians uh, got a hold of these texts and they use them more for spirituality purposes, but the Aryans used them for technology and different things like that, which kind of... Um, Nazis kind of took the took the banner on that as well and continued to do that. And so um, the the Indians believe that these entities are not mythology. They do not believe that at all. They believe that they are 100 percent flesh and bone, flesh and blood entities that walk the face of the earth. And they still uh, believe in encounters from these entities. And so um, one thing that we find is in in June 2011, in the Indus Valley, Pakistan paleontologists discovered a 4,300-year-old human skull with drill holes in it. And as you can see in this picture here, you can see the drill holes. I've got little arrows pointing to them. And they concluded that brain surgery was performed because of the precise location of the holes. And they also concluded that there was advanced healing uh, indicating that the surgery was a success. And this is 4,300 years old. I mean, this is ancient. And uh, there's much older evidence of this that has been found across the world. Uh, they In Peru, they dated one to about 5,000 years ago. And the current discovery, it get, basically it gives a concrete proof about this being a case where uh, the person who underwent the surgery survived it. And so they knew what they were doing. Uh, but 
much of the medical knowledge in the Vedic Sanskrit texts is they say it dates back to 800 BC. And, um, but it was known as Shushracha Samhita. And for those of you that don't know what that means, there's a guy named uh, Praveen Mohan that translated this. Basically what that means is that Sushrata Samhita was not the author. Sushrata, I believe means, I think it's Sushrata that actually means that it was translated from gods. And so the text was, um, it has information on 11,000 illnesses, 700 med medicinal plants, 64 preparations for mineral resources, 57 preparations for animal resources, and it is the foundation for Indian medicine. And so um, when we talk about in the book of Enoch that they gave all these different things for the roots, cutting of roots, all these different things, this is what we're talking about. And there's eight different types of surgical operations that are still used today, incising, excising, scraping, puncturing, probing, extracting, secreting fluids, and suturing. And this book was written, at least by the dates that they're given, was more than 100 years before Hippocrates, and he's the father of modern medicine. And another practice that we have along with this is yoga. And I know that, like, you know, this is this is a not very popular subject. And I imagine in our crowd, most people know a lot about yoga, know that there's um, religion attached to yoga. Um, but yoga actually means, um, it means yoking. So it means to yoke and it means to yoke yourself with the rays of the spiritual dawn. And that is something that you have to be, it says not to be unequally yoked in the scripture. Also yoking yourself to something that is a part of a different religion that is possibly, uh, and in my opinion, most likely um, translated down through ancient beings, uh, watchers, uh, is very, very dangerous. And even the yogis warn against doing yoga wrong and uh, and um, they warn they warn against physical and mental issues. And this guy is Sanguru, and he's um, he's probably one of the most popular, and he's a, considered a master of yoga. But he gives very strong warnings to people who practice yoga, uh, saying that wrong yoga can yoga can cause insanity. And he actually even gives in the video that I played in my last presentation, he gives a um, example of this causing insanity, basically, in a young boy uh, that was doing wrong yoga. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, David, before I go off to aviation? Yes, there are sadly many churches, and I mean many, that are trying to do with yoga with what they do so many areas. They're trying to sanctify paganism, and they're putting forth Christian yoga, and they're having yoga classes in many churches. You could find this right here in Evansville. And we must also warn believers that yoga will open doors up in you, and very, very serious doors, even by the admission of the practitioners of yoga. Uh, serious, serious doors. So absolutely stay away from it. And if you have participated in yoga, you need to repent, renounce, and close those doors because this is very, very toxic, powerful stuff. And it will definitely bring you into contact with these fallen principalities. Most definitely. Um, and like David said, it's amazing to me to see it in the churches. And I just can't believe it, um, how far we've kind of gone away from just... Uh, you know, common sense, I guess you could say, and, and just being able to research stuff and see, I mean, you know, they didn't even try to change the name. It's the same name, yet people still practice it. So, Right. And uh, I saw one the other day. It had yoga, and it had a sign for yoga, and it had the Christian fish symbol there beside of it. You know, they're now advertising with their symbols, the Christian yoga. So stay away from it. Don't be fooled. Exactly. And so we'll move on to aviation here. I'm going to move on to this because I think this is pretty, um, pretty valid um, and also interesting. So at the Indian Congress Science and Technology uh, for Human Development 2015, uh, most of the presenters believed that ancient Indian planes uh, were able to travel across solar systems, but they could move and they could also move left, right and backwards, unlike the modern planes that only fly forward. And um, 
Captain Anand Bodas, he was quoted in the Mumbai Mirror, uh, he told the engineers that they should recreate what they see in the ancient Vedic texts. Um, and in the Vedic text, Vimana is the word used for ancient flying crafts. And we had a guy on, and I cannot, for the life of me, can't think of his name right now, uh, Ali something. And he was talking about the Vimana, which is an interesting, interesting subject altogether. And so um, in 1895, eight years before the Wright brothers launched their airplane, uh, Shivkar Talpade tested an aircraft he crafted based on the information in the ancient Indian text and it's recorded, uh, and wrote and wrote by his, one of his students. Um, his name was Salto Wellakar. If that's not a mouthful there, I don't know. You know, you can spell it S A T A W L E K A R. And he wrote and recorded that he flew for 15, he flew for a few minutes at 1500 feet. And the Wright brothers only flew 120 feet for 12 seconds. And uh, this is this is something really interesting here. I'm going to see. I'm going to play. This is a screenshot that I have. But as you can see at the top here, this is from the International Journal of Engineering and Innovative Technology, Volume Four, Issue Three, September 2014. And you can look this up and find this yourself online. Uh, but there's a craft in the Sumaranga Sutradhara, and uh, it uses a vortex with mercury to create a propulsion. The the Vedic ion engine was mentioned in this journal, uh, and NASA tried to recreate this machine. Uh, I like Eon propulsion technology was developed at Glenn. Developed at Glenn began with Harold Kaufman, who is now retired. Um, from NASA, but he designed this first broad beam electro bombardment ion engine in 1959. And, and so I, I've, you can see some of this stuff here, but it talks about NASA. It talks about different ideas behind it. And it's an interesting document, but um, a lot of people believe that they've used this technology for what we would call satellites. And, and I, for one, believe that there probably are satellites up there just based on, based on the idea that, um, when you install a satellite system into somebody's house, it is pointing at the sky. I, I, of course, there could be land-based technology at that, but at the same time, if there are satellites that are flying around up there using this technology, it'd be easy to keep them up and they could stay up there for a pound of time. And uh, I know that a lot of, of flat earthers don't believe that there are satellites um, and there may not be, but I believe that uh, if there are, this is the kind of technology that we're using here for this kind of stuff. And so, uh, there's also weapons mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, which is part of the Vedas. And we this paranoid looking guy here, uh, I'll talk about here in just a second. But um, the Bhagavad Gita is believed to be written around 500 BC. Uh, but mythology in the book and the book itself claims to be 10,000 years old. And um, it's it's that's an, that's very very old. If that's the case, I mean, we, we a lot of new earth believers believe the Earth to be only ten, you know, six thousand years old, and I believe personally that uh, it's probably older than that, older than six thousand, closer to civilization being closer to ten thousand because we do find ancient civilizations. But then again, I'm not a professional when it comes to that subject. But either way, it claims to be about ten thousand years old. And the guy you're looking at here is uh, Robert Oppenheimer, J. Robert Oppenheimer. And he was a physicist, a theoretical physicist, and um, he was the director of the Manhattan Project uh, in the World War II effort to develop nuclear weapons. And um, he, his title was the father of the atomic bomb. And at the Trinity test site in Los Alamos, uh, New Mexico, um, near a place called the road to death, which is on the 33rd degree parallel. Uh, he spoke the words. Now I become death, the destroyer of worlds after the bomb had dropped. And this quote is actually chapter 11, verse 32 of the Bhagavad Gita. And, um, he, there's a clip you can find of him quoting that on NBC on YouTube. You can find that, um, he was raised in a Jewish home, but he was deep in study of the Vedic philosophy, his brother said that he was, uh, he loved, basically he loved it. He would give it to all his friends. He carried a copy with him everywhere that he went. 
and um, and he said he, he himself said the access to the Vedas is the greatest privilege this century may claim all oh let me read that again access to the Vedas is the greatest privilege this century man claim may claim over all previous centuries and so he really highly respected it and he, he was given a lecture at Rochester University and during the question and answer period a student ask a question a question which this brings up my next slide I I'm kind of premature on this next slide but uh, he gave an interesting answer the student asked him was the bomb exploded at Alamogordo during the Manhattan Project the first one detonated and he and Oppenheimer said yes in modern times of course which kind of leaves it open to the, the idea that it was possibly detonated before and I know David has some stuff on this but I'm gonna read this one first and talk about look, talk about this big crater that you guys are looking at here and um, in Rajasthan India there's this three square mile area that's got a heavy layer of radioactive ash over it and this is what we're looking at right here and the scientists um, while scientists were investigating the site they found high birth uh, high uh, rate of birth defects and a high number of cancer like a higher way higher number of people that had cancer in the area uh, that they were doing under construction and then the levels of the radiation registered so high that they had to cordon off the region um, and the, as they uncovered it they realized there was a whole ancient civilization there that had been basically destroyed covered in ash and looked like what they believed to be atomic blasts and they believed the evidence um this is this place is thousands of years old by the way and uh one of the they one of the uh, researcher estimated that the nuclear bomb was about the size of the ones dropped on japan in 1945 and this is a verse from the mahabharata and you guys you know, this is basically describes a nuclear weapon to me. It says, uh, this is a single projectile charged with all the power of the universe, an incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as a thousand suns rolls in all its splendor, a perpendicular explosion with its billowing smoke clouds, the cloud of smoke rising after its first explosion form into expanding round circles like the opening of a giant parasol. It was an unknown weapon, an iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death, which reduced to ashes the entire race of Vrishnis and Andhakas. The corpses were so burned as to be unrecognizable. The hair and nails fell out, pottery broke without apparent cause, and the birds turned white after a few hours. All foodstuffs were infected. To escape from this fire, the soldiers, the soldiers threw themselves in streams to wash themselves and their equipment. And so uh, I know, David, you have some things, some other civilizations that there's proof of this as well, if you want to talk about that. Okay. And there's not only this amazing ancient text that John just read that describes a nuclear explosion. There's also scientific evidence that would support ancient nuclear technology. And one of those would be and I'm going to spell it for our listeners because I know our listeners are tremendously intelligent and they like to search these things out and we encourage that. We don't want anyone checking their brains at the door. And the, the, this name of the city is Aklo, Aklo Gabon, O-K-L-O -O is the name of the city and G-A-B-O-N B-O-N is the name of the country. It's a Central African nation. And at Aklo Gabon, in over 12 sites, over a dozen sites, French scientists discovered radioactive isotopes, plutonium among others. And what's extremely compelling about this is that plutonium can only be produced by a man-made process. And there's some amazing newspaper paper articles in the New York Times that were written in the 70s that were just absolutely taken back by this discovery. And finally, what they said for public consumption is that this just somehow occurred naturally. But what we have is compelling evidence that there were ancient nuclear reactors. There is also in the Libyan desert 
an area that is 130 by 53 kilometers in this area. And there's a huge area where green glass is found. Now, what's significant about this is that when uh, in the late 50s and in the early 60s, when they were doing nuclear tests in New Mexico, and by the way, my uncle was a nuclear physicist that took part in those underground nuclear tests out there. But anyway, they found that this nuclear explosion, when they did them above ground, that it created this green glass. But in Libya, in this area, this green glass is their 16 pounds some of these that they've weighed they're large chunks of this glass and uh lightning can sometimes produce a small amount of this but nothing like what we see in libya and uh what scientists say is this could only be produced by a nuclear explosion and if that isn't compelling enough what becomes even more compelling is um this green glass was considered significant in these ancient megalithic sites and in the religious use. And at Chicken Itza, which is one of the most fascinating sites where there's a pyramid in South America, and uh, at Chicken Itza, there is a picture, uh, an engraving of a puma. And on this puma, there are 72 pieces of jade and uh, of this green and we see this green uh, associated with the number 72 which we were talking about uh, I believe you mentioned this in one of our recent broadcasts and we've got the number 72 the the so-called 72 names of God that Kabbalists uh, will make much of and also the 72 stars in the dome of the capital and on and on and on the number 72 and here on this puma at chicken itza we see the 72 pieces of green jade taking on religious significance so there are just many things that uh, are unexplained if we're going to buy in to the idea that these ancient peoples were just ignorant and more and more not only these ancient texts but scientific facts are beginning to give a very very strong case and in my mind just absolutely conclusive that there was indeed an ancient civilization that had nuclear technology the ability to fly uh, and uh, things that were perhaps even more advanced than what we have today. And this just bears out the scripture that we read uh, in Ecclesiastes, that the thing which is now is that which has been. And uh, the word of God is always going to be true. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly, that's exactly right. 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 I'm getting an getting echo. An echo. Not sure exactly why. There we go. A little bit better there. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, there you you see this everywhere. I know. Uh, I was gonna. I didn't put the picture in here, but there's an ancient um, in Rankapur, I believe, is where the temple is, and I'm gonna be talking about Rankapur here as well. Rankapur, there's a there's columns there that look and and I and being a, a machinist, I used to be a machinist, and I used to work with in mills, and I used to cut metal. We cut all kinds of different things, carbon, etc. And when you cut these things with these end mills, you see tool marks and tools. They look like they look almost like a drill bit, but they're flat on the end. But they cut through metal. You can cut uh, shapes into metal. You can cut shapes into stone. I mean, you can cut shapes into anything with it. But these these columns are most definitely, uh, in my opinion, and in other people's opinion too. But when you look at them, they most definitely are done with the tool markings. And we have ancient. Uh, machines that they found and, and I'm, I'll get into some of that here in a little bit but I want to go on to quantum physics and inventions because um, obviously NASA and all these other organizations that are around today are very uh, into quantum physics and they're very into these ideas and quantum physics I used to think it was just a, 
a bunch of malarkey, like just people coming up with ideas. But I'm starting to find out that this quantum physics is not just a bunch of malarkey and people coming up with ideas. It's actual ancient uh, physics and ancient stuff that people use for, uh, I believe, these this information of the gods, these things we weren't supposed to know about. And um, at the temple of Renekpur, on the ceiling, we find um, architecture and it looks to me it looks a lot like the hadron collider held at cern uh when you get up close to it and actually look at the look at it look at the number of columns that it has etc it's very very close to this um this particle accelerator that is you'll see at cern it's one of the world's largest it's the world's largest at this point i know china is building one that's supposed to be several times bigger uh, but all the scientists associated with cern and most notable quantum physics practitioners are they admire the vedic text this is like one of their texts that they really cling to and there's a practice we'll talk about later that they cling to that is a part of the vedic text and as we know at the courtyards of cern uh, we have the hindu god shiva which is the destroyer of worlds and in the town where uh, france in france where cern is partially situated as you can see here on this map where CERN sits and part of it, just a small part of it is over in France. And, um, but there on that part, they have, it's called St. Genus Pauli. And the name Pauli comes from the Latin word apoliacum. And, um, it's believed that, um, there was a Roman temple or Roman times, a temple existed in honor of Apollo there. And the people who lived there believed it's a gateway to the underworld. And, um, so anyway, let me just see where I'm at here. Um, so CERN's built on the same exact spot. And as we know, in revelations nine, um, it says to him was given the key of the bottomless pit and he opened the bottomless pit and they had a kind over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Uh, in Greek, the word Apollyon means destroyer, just like the uh, deity Shiva that is positioned outside of CERN. And um, there's a, there is a uh, ritual that was performed near CERN called the Goddard Tunnel. And um, I'm going to play this while I'm talking it you guys won't hear any sound I don't believe in um, because I like I said I don't have a mixer here but there is this ritual that was played uh, and most of you guys probably saw it but um, there was people that were there that look it looked like the United Nations meaning the, the number the caliber of the people that were actually at this Goddard turn reach uh, ritual and um, it has some amazing symbolism and uh, I was talking with with the um, Stephen Pigeon the other night, and he was talking a little bit about it. He, he watched the whole thing, and I've watched the whole thing. We did. Me and a, a friend of mine did a breakdown of it uh, during the time it was being performed. But you see these um, high level people here at this thing, and some very weird things going on. Um, you see these helicopters landing, and you see these people blowing these crazy trumpets as we're watching here. We have all these mystical looking beings dancing in front of what looks like a portal here. And this goat like creature, um, David could probably break down some of this symbology for us too. David, what do you think about some of this stuff? Yeah. And I want to give a shout out to Lydia. She is one of our regular listeners. I don't know if Lydia is in the chat. She's in the chat many times on the midnight ride she lives just a few miles from here and mm, uh, cool. absolutely there is all of the satanic symbolism here the sacrilegious uh beings that look like nuns and you see spirits. you see this right here this portal looking thing where these go looks like these ghosts oh, are coming out of it and oh, you have wow. this baphomet looking creature in this portal with people it looks like people crying like from like that may be in Sheol or something, you have these beetles and, you know, and in, in the Bible, it talks about, um, what, uh, I guess it's, um, the place of burning where the beetles, 
it, it's this is interesting stuff, man. When you look at this, this is crazy, crazy stuff. But this was going on. I mean, this is you know you would this is more than you would imagine from um, a tunnel being built, and this is pretty close to CERN. It's not right by it or anything, but I mean, you see some really, really creepy stuff on there. So. Yeah, um, there a beetle was used in the Egyptian Book of the Dead in the ritual of the opening of the mouth. And it has tremendous occult significance for the opening up of portals and gates. And this uh, little guy dressed up here, he looks a lot like the Baphomet. And we also have a lot of Krampus imagery there, too, uh, that looks a lot like Krampus. And it's the symbolism of all of this is unmistakable. It is just an absolute pagan reveling. And in the dancing, it just became uh, overtly sexual, portraying this wild casting off of inhibitions that was a part of the pagan mysteries. And there was no mistaking the symbology of the opening of the gate and of course the actual drilling of a tunnel we have the we read the scripture from the septuagint in isaiah 13 that actually talks about the gates of the underworld being opened up and the giants coming forth and all of this is unmistakably per portrayed in this opening here of the gothard tunnel most definitely. And um, as we go on to continue, I want to talk about physicists. Uh, we have Nikolai Tesla, which is probably uh, one of the most popular and definitely prob uh, definitely the most brilliant scientist uh, that has been known uh, to this day. And in his book, uh, it was called, the book's called Sem the S Man's Greatest Achievements is what the book's called. And the quote from there is, um, all perceptible matter comes from a primary substance or tenuity but beyond concept, filling all space, the akasha or luminiferous ether, which is acted upon by the life-giving prana or creative force calling into existence in never-ending cycles, all things and phenomenon. Uh, both of those words that I have highlighted there are mentioned in the Vedic texts, though you don't find those words in anything else. And um, his friend that we see here in this picture, um, he, uh, what is his name? His name is Swami Vimvinkanda, and he was a Hindu reformist. And there's several pictures of him and Tesla together. And he said Tesla was charmed to hear about the Vedantic prana and akasha and the kapas which according to him are the only theories modern science can entertain. Now both Akasha and Prana are produced from the Mahat or the universal mind. Mr. Tesla thinks he can demonstrate mathematically the force and matter are reducible to potential energy. In that case, the Vandatic, Vad, Vedantic cosmology will be placed on the surest of foundations. I'm working a good deal now upon the cosmology and eschatology of Vedanta I clearly see their perf perfect union with modern science and the elucidation of the one will be followed by that of the other. And the, an interesting turn we see here that this is something that um, the, when it says Mahat or the universal mind, these two things right here, uh, this one thing, but the universal mind in English is something that Steve Jobs was into. This is something that all of these guys were into him because they were pulling from what they call this thing, the Mahat. And when he talks about the Akasha and the Prana, these basically what they believe this is, David and, and audience out there, they believe that when they tap into this, it's all the information that is available in the world. And um, Tesla is said to have, you know, uttered things without his knowledge and he uttered things and he uttered out, you know, things that he was doing, mathematics, inventions, etc., by going into this universal mind. Uh, there's interesting things that have happened over the years and we have over a hundred different cases of people actually bringing to uh, the patent office the same inventions on the same exact day. And most of these people claim to being able to tap into this Mahat and 
this is interesting. So when we talk about, they believe it to be a guiding force, um, as in 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 uh, Tesla's own words, all perceivable matter comes from a primary substance beyond con uh, beyond conception, filling all space, the akasha or luminiferous ether, which is acted upon by the life giving prana or creative force. So they believe this is a creative force that they're tapping into that has all knowledge. And so Tesla wasn't just a genius, but he was also a man tapping into these, this force that they call that they believe that actually guides humanity into what it's supposed to be today. So you get certain things different times during this. So it's kind of guiding humanity toward newer inventions. And so when a lot of people think of these inventions, especially ones like the things Tesla did and the people at CERN are doing all this stuff, this stuff is not just a normal man's concept. This is stuff that they're getting from the, from another place. This is not, um, this is not just so they're really super smart. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the term genius. Um, Many, m many technologies, formulas, ideas are, have been attributed to spiritual entities. Um, I mean, the, almost all profound discoveries, they have a very similar story. Um, a genius is a person who displays extraordinary ability and they can, they, they're known to create things and they really just outdo everybody in their area of expertise. And um, the word today is thrown around just, I mean, people call everybody a genius. Oh, that guy's a genius. That guy's a genius. Uh, or I'm a genius. You know, they do a test and they think they're a genius or whatever. But um, in ancient Rome, the the genius, plural, uh, was a guiding spirit or genie. I guess in this, the uh, plural of genius is genie, was a guiding spirit um, or a deity of a person or a family. And so these deities would attach themselves to a person. A genie or a genie um, is a spiritual creature, creature mentioned in Islamic theology. Um, and, and that's where the word derives from the Latin genius. And um, it's also a guardship spirit from ancient Roman religions. And there's a hereditary genius um, that's notable in a lot of families. Like you'll see like uh, somebody that's a high level occultists, Satanists, whatever you want to call them, but the Bacon family, there was a lot of scientists that came out of his family and the Darwin family, um, two people that are plagued society uh, with their stuff and, and just completely, um, you know, really added to the occult realm, I guess, here on the earth. And um, so the Roman idea is that they this genie would stay with one person that would pass on to family. So when we talk about generational curses and stuff like that, and we talk about generational entities, uh, this is what we're talking about here. And the Greeks believed, um, and I, I guess I don't have the, I had another picture here, but the Greeks believed that they were inspired uh, by muses. And um, there were nine goddesses. They were the daughters of Zeus and the most and they presided over arts and sciences. And, um, the muses, the term, the muses, where we get the English term music, and the spirit of the muse would enter a person, and give them inspiration, uh, which is also an interesting term that means spirit inside. And um, at the time, these words had a lot of meaning. Today, people, oh, I'm, I'm feeling really inspired right now. Are they, you know, people will use it just kind of just whatever way they want to use it, but these terms actually have a real meaning. And um, another genius in madras india in the early 1900s there's a man named srinivasa ramanujan and he had no formal training in mathematics and yet he made uh some of the greatest contributions to mathematics in in history and he um in, in analysis number theory infinite series continued fractions uh solutions to mathematic problems that were considered to be unsolvable this guy uh gave to society and um in his life he produced like 3900 results or more and inspired a bunch of new research and still to this day um it is the most advanced form of mathematics used in quantum mechanics and ramanujan cr uh, credited his mathematical capacities to divinity and uh the quote here at the bottom you can read it here um 
he he gave he displayed i guess he revealed it re, it was revealed to him according to him by the family goddess known as namagiri and uh, here's this quote it says an equation for me has no meaning he once said unless it expresses a thought of god and so that kind of ends some of the stuff i want to talk about on david you know you can expand on any of this stuff at all but this is the kind of stuff that we um where we get our geniuses in life and our people that have developed so many of these new technologies that are kind of leading us into this age that we have now have, have gotten this stuff from the Vedic text and the um, universal mind idea. And this, and this is one of the reasons I brought the Vedic text out so much is because, uh, and obviously, like I said, the muses, Greeks, Pythagoras, all those other people had this kind of theory as well, except they called it a, something a little bit different. They were tapping into the muses, but we have this, um, idea that is historical and I believe is fact. I mean, when all of these people claim this and people are smart, but when you have somebody that can do stuff like this, this is, um, this is not something that humanity, um, has been capable of. I mean, we see, you know, with the Babylon workings and all this stuff in 1940, um, 1947 we see such a huge influx of of technology i mean people were literally riding horses in the late 1800s early 1900s and now to this day we have jets that travel across the world we have computers that fit in the palm of your hand we have um, just an amazing amount of technology we have holographic technology we have virtual reality technology we have um particle colliders we you know i mean you name it there's so many things that we have that have just jumped in this huge day of information and i would submit that all of this stuff came from fallen entities fallen texts fallen angel texts and the texts of the watchers and i would agree wholeheartedly and uh, a tremendous job on your research john really really good thank and you I want to say also to our listeners, get your questions in. We're not that far from question time, so get your questions in for John. And when we say the word genius, I think probably the name that would most readily come to mind would probably be Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. And Albert Einstein, one interesting thing, he absolutely poo-pooed quantum physics and said there's no way that quantum physics was legitimate science. And I agree with your idea. Uh, I think rather than, I think quantum physics is a reality, but I think instead of any kind of legitimate science, it's fallen angel technology. They're tapping into spirits that are teaching uh, this dark stuff. So... But Albert Einstein had a friend by the name of Charles Hapgood, and Charles Hapgood wrote a book called The Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, and Albert Einstein endorsed the work of his friend in this area, and basically what Mr. Hapgood said, and he based this upon the Pyre Reese map, which was, uh, Pyre Reese was a Turkish sea captain that lived in the 1500s, and Pyre Reese had a map that showed Antarctica, which supposedly wasn't discovered until 1818. And not only that, but the coastline of Antarctica without ice on it. And Mr. Hapgood concluded, as we have put forth this evening, and Mr. Einstein approved and endorsed the work of his friend, that indeed there was an ancient global civilization that was capable of worldwide travel as advanced or more advanced than the civilization that we are aware of today. And another little interesting point, uh, you threw some dates out tonight that might make some people stumble a little bit. And uh, I've got a book, I've got a Bible, my Thompson chain, which has the Bishop Usher dates. Um, in the columns and it's very helpful and it gives you good uh a ballpark uh, meridian to work with if you will but bishop usher would date the creation of adam at 4004 bc and many people when 
uh, you throw out dates that are older than that would obviously dismiss them immediately. But as I was a young believer, uh, way back in the early 70s, during this time period is when the young earth creation science movement began and really began to take hold and become popular. And Henry Morris predates that. But the father of the young earth creation science movement was a man by the name of Henry Morris, who I've got uh, two books by Mr. Morris still in my library, the Genesis record. And uh, the other one, I can't remember, the big biblical basis for uh, science or something like that. But anyway, I want to read a statement by Henry Morris, and this will probably shock a lot of modern young earthers. But on page 45 of the Genesis record, he makes a statement that would shock a lot of young creation scientists today. But he actually states in the Genesis record on page 45 that the date of the creation of Adam could have been as old as 10,000 BC. Now, the reason, and I'll just read what Mr. Morse said. He said, many writers have argued that one or more gaps of unknown magnitude may be assumed in these lists, speaking of the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11, especially in Genesis 11. This possibility will be discussed later in the commentary on these chapters. Consequently, the Bible will not support a date for the creation of man earlier than about 10,000 B.C. And this amazingly, and, and the reason for that is in the genealogies, when it says this person begat that person, it might be not only the father, but it could be the grandfather, great-grandfather, or great-great-grandfather. And just from comparing the genealogies in the new with the old, just from scripture, you can tell that this is a fact. And when Mr. Usher compiled, and he did a tremendous job, by the way, I mean, he really did a tremendous job and a lot of work. But when Mr. Usher compiled his genealogies, he did not take into consideration these gaps. So therefore, uh, the creation of Adam could have been as far back as 10,000 BC. So this puts the dates that you threw out tonight very much within a credible biblical framework. And also, what's very fascinating is that Graham Hancock, in his book, The Fingerprints of the Gods and Heaven's Mirror, and Mr. Hancock is not a believer, but an absolutely brilliant researcher, and he puts forth, and this is basically the whole thrust of The Fingerprints of the Gods, is that at in the year 10,500 B.C., that there was a tremendous cataclysm that destroyed this previous ancient civilization. And myself being a proponent, as many of our listeners know, we've done shows on this, of the gap theory. This would very much fit within uh, Mr. Graham Hancock's work, who also, by the way, argues for two global floods. And this is why I like him, because he confirms a lot of my ideas. And this also fits right with what Plato, Plato gives a date in the, in the Timaeus and the Critias, that of the destruction of Atlantis. And all of these dates, the date that Mr. Morris would give on uh, based on the gaps of the genealogies, the date that Graham Hancock would give, and the date from Plato for the destruction of Atlantis. These all coincide right around the year 10,000 BC that there was indeed prior to this time a very advanced civilization. And I believe, and of course this isn't the scope of the discussion tonight, it's a rabbit trail, but I believe that the more a person studies ancient civilizations and ancient technology, the more open you become to entertaining the idea of the gap theory and of uh, of civilization that would have been prior to that of Adam. And, you know, I could throw out names um, 
uh, whether it be Stephen Quayle or Timothy Alberino or Tom Horn or our friend Gary Wayne, uh, who'll be on in a, in a couple of weeks again, or Zen Garcia or myself, all of these people have come to believe in this idea. And the more you study into this, the more you realize that uh, this could indeed be so. And that when you put this all together, that you find a very consistent picture that there can indeed be tremendous agreement between the word of God and the findings that are, are, that are coming forth. And, and there definitely is. And this is one of the things that, um, how do I get this overlay off here? There we go. And this is one of the reasons that I think the church has kind of fell miserably is because it's chose not to even acknowledge a lot of the stuff we're talking about tonight. They choose to, I, I remember asking about this, uh, after I found out about it to a pastor and he thought it was the most ludicrous thing in the world, this idea of these fallen angels coming down, they give the verse, you know, angels don't marry and are, mm -hmm. are you know, are nearly given in marriage and stuff, but mm -hmm. obviously not anymore. I mean, we see the, we see the, um, the judgment that was placed on these, these beings was so grievous and so horrible that the angels knees knocked together. They were frightened because of this judgment. And a lot of people believe that, you know, this has continued after the flood. I don't think so. I don't think that this is a continuation of this stuff that's happened. This is, this is something that the, this, if you can imagine an immortal being, something that has lived, lives forever, has lived thousands of years, probably before this happened, uh, I mean, it says that the angels were there in Job 38, 7. It says that the angels were there when he founded the earth, when he did the foundations of the earth. He lived for a long time, and to see them being chained in darkness for an eternity and eventually thrown into fire uh, at the end, this is something that absolutely terrifies angelic entities even those angelic entities that are here on the earth at this time and i believe are rulers of this earth and a lot of the a lot of the people that we see in power uh, may actually have an entity ascribed to them or may be controlled by an entity maybe an entity themselves we don't know but they the, one of the reasons that they haven't jumped in and tried to start teaching people all these different things and they haven't tried to mate with women to have their own children is because of this judgment and so uh, obviously, the Nephilim are doomed to this earth. They're here, this earth, as evil spirits. And so they, them passing this information would not be a breach of contract, I guess you could say, for these entities. But the church denying this stuff and, and completely uh, casting it off as ludicrous has caused a lot of people to fall away because in this age of information, we have almost every text at our fingertips. I mean, I could take this phone right here and pretty much find any ancient text that I want right here at my phone and read it. And I can find almost everything about discoveries that have happened in this world right here from my phone. Uh, of course, there probably are some books and stuff that the Vatican and, and uh, secret societies have hidden from us, but we can find pretty much everything um, right there. So, I mean, I'm, I'm on board with you. And the more I study it, the more I feel like there's a real possibility this earth, earth is much older than we believe it is or that then young earth creations believe it is. Uh, I do believe that humanity as we know it is not as old as the earth itself, uh, possibly be, you know, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of biblical proof to back this idea up. And of course I don't claim to know everything about this subject, but, um, it's interesting. And when we look at, we look at a lot of proof of findings of different things, such as, um, you know, Neanderthals and all these different entities. This looks like Atlantis. We have, you know, when you see Lord of the Rings, you see these hobbits, you see these uh, giant looking beings, you see all these different entities that we know existed because you can find skeletons of these things. We have fairy graves that they call them in Tennessee and Kentucky and oh, areas yeah. like that. And we have just interesting things all over the world that there's no explanation for um, other than this. So, And as we get ready to segue into our questions here in just a couple of moments. Um, we could just talk and talk and talk. I just love yeah. this topic. And I might just say that I really appreciate a lot of the work that um, I've read Henry Morse for years and a lot of the young earth creationists have done some tremendous work. Definitely. They're, ap they're apologetic on evolution of just pristine. And you could very well 
see Sister Donna and I go over to the Creation Museum in the Ark. We could do it. Uh, you could see that happen. And uh, we could be bringing back our report. But something we have to remember, and as someone that's taught the gap theory for about four decades, the great the people that are most antagonistic and hostile are the young earthers. And we might also remember that these are also some of the people that are the most antagonistic to the enclosed flat earth cosmology. And I just want to make this point that whether it's secular science or the theories of a believer that is a scientist, we always want to try to be as unbiased as we can to make scripture our guide. And, you know, we're so oftentimes, and I've made the statement repeatedly, that in the secular world, the scientists have become the priest. And if they say something, it's just taken as a fact. And we don't want to be that way, whether it's a secular or a believer that is a scientist. I love, I just love to listen to people espouse their theories, but we have to remember that it's a very slippery slope in science and that it is the Word of God that is our guide. So with that, we are going to have Sister Donna begin with the questions and go right ahead, Sister Donna. Okay. We have about 15 of them here. Um, the first one is from Carol Lissa, and she wants to know, um, speaking of the men of renown, I was reading in Ezekiel today and was fascinated when I saw in Ezekiel 23, 23, also mention the men of renown. What do you think the connection is? It's not as though that's a common phrase. David, would you like to answer this first? In Ezekiel 23, 23, yes, the, Bala the Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, Pakad and Shoah and Koah, and all the Assyrians with them, all of them desirable young men, captains and rulers, great lords, and renowned, all of them riding upon horses. And I don't know if we can say that these would be precisely what's being spoken of in Genesis 6, how that the giants became men of renown in the antediluvian period. Um, I, I have never really studied this scripture, and just on the face of an initial reading, I would be very hesitant, And but to connect them directly, directly with Nephilim, though we know, we absolutely know that the Babylonians and the Assyrians were all definitely um, infected highly with um, Nephilim genetics. So I would just have to say that uh, this is a fascinating scripture. I'd like to look into it more. And, um, you know, it's a neat scripture, something to think about. Okay, the next question is from YouTube, from Alan. Would it be safe to assume that modern encrypteds like Bigfoot are evolved from Nephilim? He said devolved. I thought he meant evolved. But. I don't mean, I don't mean, mean, mean. Wow, wow. Okay, I got to go, go there. All right. Oh, there we go. It's gone now. Me, John Hall, and Leon... I can't remember this. Leon Winham mm -hmm. are doing a show this coming Thursday on Bigfoot and should be wow. interested. This is John Hall's return uh, to Now You See TV for one show to do a show on, on Bigfoot. And it's a subject he's really interested in. And we're looking forward to it. But yeah, I believe that if they are around, um, there is most likely some kind of connection to that. But then again, um, cryptids, a lot of times, there's so many. Um, species of animals that we have not discovered and that we have not seen. I mean, only a small percentage of the ocean has been, has been searched out. Um, there's cave systems, especially in Kentucky, 
that go for miles and miles and miles and anything, any kind of animal that wanted to stay hidden could easily be hidden in these systems. So Bigfoot could very well be a spiritual being, but it could also be um, a species of animal that we have yet to really pin down um, because I do believe that Bigfoots are a very real possibility that they exist. Um, there's so many people that have seen them. I have not seen one and I am yet skeptical at the same time, but uh, you know, I, I'm never going to put the idea that it's not possible. I know that um, the lady that went searching for baboon or for uh, gorillas, the, they made a movie about her called gorilla in the mist. I believe her name was Jane Goodall. If I can, if, if that's the right name, but she went looking for these gorillas. She knew they were there. She saw the dropping. She saw the footprint. She saw that stuff, but it took her a long time for they would actually show themselves. So if there is an ape like creature that wants to stay hidden, it can easily stay hidden, especially in these cave systems. So um, whether or not they're Nephilim or not, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess that's possible. I believe that a lot of the Nephilim DNA has been so diluted over the years that it's hard to tell uh, Nephilim from the real thing. And I, of course there's the, the giant they found in, um, supposedly found in Iraq, I believe it was, what is, I can't remember what that giant was actually called, but, um, so there, I guess it's possible. I mean, anything's possible. Um, but I don't, I know that I don't know for sure. Well, Leon's been wanting to do that for a long time. So I'm excited about that. And did you say that was going to be Thursday? Thursday. Yeah. We'll be actually be at the at the place for the conference that night and we'll be doing the show from the, the hotel i'll be doing it from the hotel because i'll be there thursday uh to set up for video and so the the um so we'll be doing the show from there so i'm excited that's coming up this week okay the next question is from Lori, and she says i understand pilates is supposed to be a place of spiritual darkness didn't the lds angel moroni claim to be from there but why then and I'm not sure about that. Uh, very well so. I know that Charles Taz Russell uh, made statements about uh, believing God was from the Pleiades. But I don't know about Mormonism. Um, I'd like to see some uh, documentation on that. It w I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it a bit. We always say, if we don't know it, we'll look it up. That's right. <laughs> so we'll try to find that out. Okay, from um, Thrubs, uh, Universal Mind with the frequencies used like Nexrad for weather notification. Do you see Torah frequencies right doing with power disrupting their Unabunga? I know, I didn't understand that either, but. <laughs> Do I see Torah frequencies disrupting their, the universal mind, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I guess. what he asked. Yes. Um. I don't see that happening, but I'm sure that, you know, rebuking some of this stuff is never a bad idea. I mean, you know, the universal mind thing is, is something that they've been practicing for a long time. This is something that this has basically shaped our civilization, this idea of tapping into this and what I believe is demonic entities, giving information, leading society the way it wants it to go to bring on the new world order. Um, there's obviously frequencies in the things we wear, the things we say, uh, it, you know, there's frequencies in everything. I don't see it personally disrupting that. But then again, you know, I don't know, obviously I, I can't see into this realm that would show me that this is disrupting that in any way. It looks like things are coming together pretty good for the new world order. If you ask me. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, I think from YouTube as well. Uh, John and David were talking about their incantation, Ungabunga, which flows into their manifest at the ions of weather notification to call the herd. I guess that was the rest of that question. Sorry. Um, he's calling the inc their incantations Ungabunga. Ah, uh, I see. I was wondering what Ungabunga meant. Yeah. I, I don't remember. <laughs> he sounds like he's been listening to John Hall. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I guess he was wondering because he said that there is Now that would have been shakalaka moo moo, yeah, not that's, bunga. that's true. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the question was about uh, because their uh, incantations flows into their manifest at the ions of weather modification. So 
um, I guess he's intending that, wanting to know if we can disrupt that. So, and I agree with John. I believe that we can tell things to go, and they'll go, because God's given us the authority to do that. Okay, uh, number six here. Everyone is excited about the topic tonight. Um, so just want to let you know that. And Bahid from uh, the chat asks Enoch 1511. It doesn't mention men as a target. Should women be more worried about the spirits rising up against them, or is it equally dangerous for both sexes? Please explain. That was Enoch 15 and 11. I'll look it up, but I, I think that, you know, maybe not in that verse it doesn't mention men being the specific target, but um, in the verse that I read before, I'm trying to pull it up here, it talks about, them doing war with mankind, causing men and women to worship demons and also uh, being a, a, a stumbling block or a, um, I guess a, uh, let me, let me see here. Let me go back here to where the verse I was reading, if that was the one. Um, yeah, wait, it's not the same verse I read here, but it does, say, it does say, and these spirits will yeah, rise up against. Yeah, um, in the James Charlesworth translation, it says the dwelling of the spiritual beings of heaven is heaven, but the dwelling of the spirits of the earth, which are born upon the earth, is in the earth. The spirits of the giants oppress each other. They will corrupt, fall, be excited, and fall upon the earth and cause sorrow. They eat no food, nor become thirsty, nor find obstacles. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of the people and against the women because they have proceeded forth from them. And I think certainly uh, men have no get out of jail free card when it comes to the oppression of devils, uh, nor will they have, I believe, when these beings begin to manifest again. So, uh, you know, and it's interesting. In the book of Job, there's a scripture that always fascinated me uh, when it talk. Job makes reference of his enemies run a, running upon him like a giant, like a Rephaim. And uh, these, this is very much depicted in this passage in Enoch, how that these were aggressive, uh, cannibalistic murderers that uh, afflicted mankind, and now that their departed spirits uh, have become the devils, they actively pursue men and women alike. So certainly, men don't get a get out of jail free card in uh, this area. Well, and after all, if the man is the head over the woman, they better be looking out for their women. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, question number seven from uh, Cassius. Has David ever heard the occult theory that UFOs are coming to rapture the higher consciousness beings in the end time and that Christians stole the rapture idea? Yes, and uh, there are even texts that I could bring forth um, from occult sources. Some are Gnostic that speak of a catching away of just this sort. And uh, as someone that doesn't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, as is espoused in dispensationalism, I would be very much open to the idea that this does not come uh, from godly sources. So yeah, absolutely. And I don't have them at my fingertips, but I have actually read in Gnostic documents this idea of a catching away, just exactly like our listener speaks of. Okay, hang on just a second. Got to scroll back up here. Um, Allie wants to know, um, sorry, off topic a bit, kind of old news, but have you guys ever talked about the Trump time travel, Baron Trump 1800s book? If you did, I either missed that show or forgot. I love to hear David and John's commentary on that if there's time. 
there's some interesting coincidences in it. I haven't read the entire thing, uh, but what I do remember reading about it was intrigued me quite a bit. Um, but I can't really speak too much about a commentary on the whole thing. Cause like I said, I haven't read the entire thing. I did bring, uh, make a post about it not too long ago and encourage people to check it out if they wanted to. And some people uh, that had read it were, man, they, they thought it was the most amazing thing ever. So it's interesting. I don't obviously don't believe in time travel. Uh, I know a lot of people would disagree with me. I think that, um, some people perceive that they have time traveled. Uh, and, and I guess, you know, the, when, when people leave their body or they do this, um, um, astral projection, astral projection, they believe that they do a lot of things and whether they do or not, I don't know, but it's, it's definitely interesting. And, uh, it looks like, you know, Trump or somebody in his cabinet really kind of put a lot of these things together and, and tried to, I, it's uh, tell, to tell you the truth. It's interesting. That's all I can really say about it. David, have you read the entire thing yet? I haven't read the entire thing, but uh, I I do not believe in time travel or the Mandela effect. However, these devils are thousands of years old, and these secret societies they perpetuate these plans over thousands of years, and they're terribly persistent. And there are just many fascinating things about this document. And we talked a little bit about this on the show we did um, about the Denver airport and the uh, figure there in the uh, Bank of America out there in Charlotte that looks very much, or maybe it's Charleston, that looks very much like Donald Trump or maybe his son, Barron. So, you know, uh, I think there could definitely be something going on there. And uh, I think that quite possibly, and I think almost certainly, that fallen powers are seeking to fulfill their agenda in Mr. Trump. And uh, I just think it's very important to pray for him that he doesn't fall prey to these dark powers. And I have uh, been one that has drawn connections with the possibility that Mr. Trump could fulfill these end time scenarios. And even as he merged as the beast of revelation 13 and uh, did a teaching on this on our um, FOJC YouTube. And I know this is terribly controversial, but when you look at these things, Boy, there's some stuff going on here, just like these other things we're talking about tonight. There's no natural explanation for this. And I see in this a supernatural hand at work, and it's not at work for anything good. Okay. Tyler had another question. Um, have you, have either John or David heard about or read the Lacerta files? A man interviewed a reptilian female who talked about how the earth belonged to them before two advanced alien races blew up the earth with a nuclear war. The Elogian advanced aliens came back to earth and kidnapped a few homo habels and came back here after a few hundred years or so. Uh, and man was born. I'm not, I mean, I've heard of it. I know it was, I believe it was in 99 when it took place and, and the interviews like, 49 pages long and I ha and I have not read it. I attend to there's a video going around too of a what looks like a gray alien giving his explanation of humanity and I think the problem with a lot of this stuff well, obviously you know entertaining fallen entities is one but another problem is um, the lies that they could tell and I think that that's part of the reason Pythagoras and all these other people have believe in this heliocentric idea is because they have had some astounding inventions and astounding ideas from this universal mind or these muses but this is something that is part of a big deception and they believed it as well because it was given to them by the same entities or the same universal mind that they've had and so when we hear these things from demons there's going to be 
a lot of amazing technologies that we that we hear from these things. Uh, at least I hope we don't hear from. Them. I hope I don't hear from them, but you, or you. But there's going to be a lot of amazing things that we hear that come from these entities. But there's also going to be lies mixed in with the truth, and this is how they create a mass deception. This is how they lead the world into what they want it to be. So they're creating this world to get us back to Atlantis, back to this new world order idea. And part of that is going to be deception as well as information that isn't deception. So I don't read into a lot of that stuff because I don't want to pollute my mind with uh, something from a reptilian. Uh, and I'm not saying that if you read it, you're wrong for doing that. Of course, research is always, always interesting. And, and I, you know, some people may want to read it, but um, I haven't read it, and that's the reason I didn't read it. I may go into it uh, at some other time and read what it has to say, uh, but definitely an interesting thing, no doubt. This is a common scenario that's often heard on Coast to Coast, where they say the aliens are the first and they're the ones that created man, not God. It's a common thing, the way they want to switch that around. Um, mm -hmm. Allie's other question is, um, oh, okay, sorry, I answered on that. Down to George here. Okay, George has some thoughts, so I'm sharing his thoughts. He said, I wonder if the main goal of the heliocentric deception is to hide scientific truths about our world that people like Tesla stumbled upon, mechanisms that, mechanisms that allow spiritual connection that they can hide. Go ahead, I, David. I was just going to say what I said before. I mean, I think that they give information to these guys. These guys believe everything they say. Uh, some of it is bad information, some of it's good information, and of course these entities want to hide everything they can from us, uh, normal, common people, uh, because they want us to fall for a great deception. So I don't know that these scientists knew anything about it, or they think that they're actually, because I mean everything they've got quantum physics wise and everything came from these entities and it seemed to be good information. So when they hear about the heliocentric idea, they automatically assume it's good information. So they may not even know it's a deception, they may think that this is a reality who knows but I mean I, I could be wrong on that David might have a different opinion well I, and if I believe um, the and perceiving George's thoughts correctly there that I think this is absolutely why they want your average person to believe the heliocentric globe model because if everyone understood the flat earth cosmology they would be figuring out science at a rapid rate. And it's just been a few years that a lot of people have even been studying into the flat earth cosmology and look how far it's come. Look how much understanding and how many thousands of people have embraced it. So I don't think they want the average person knowing or they'd be figuring out what they know and they want to control knowledge and power. And I think this is certainly a lot of, a lot of it. I think they also want to hide the fact that God's closer to us than what you would think on a round earth, but on a flat earth, he's actually closer to us. So they don't want us to know that. Especially okay. nowadays. I mean, cause we have, they have the technology to be able to see past this lie. So definitely today, this day and age, they definitely, uh, I believe NASA knows what's going on, but I, I would say, you know, I'm just thinking back to the, you know, Pythagoras and all these characters back way back when, I don't think they had any way of even finding out if what they're saying is true or not. You know, they had no way to know. Um, they, I mean, obviously anything you can perceive from the ground right. and see, you can't, you can, you can tell that this world, in my opinion, when you look out and you look as a normal person, you're not going to think heliocentric. That's the, the you're not going to think you're a spinning globe flying through the air at 666 miles per hour or whatever it is. You're not going to think that. You're going to think you live on a flat earth. You see these stars that are above you. That's common sense. So the idea of this heliocentric idea, he had no way of proving that. I think he was just getting it from demons and passing it on to us. But NASA, I think they definitely know now. I mean, they've sent rockets up. Hear about Project, what is it, Fishbowl? And um, what are the other ones that they had? Uh, Thor, the Project Thor, I think, where they tried to send a missile up to bust the, I guess they, they named the missile Thor to Thor's hammer to go up and bust the the firmament. They have all these different projects. So they definitely know now. I mean, there's no excuse for them now. They know, and they're trying to perpetuate a lie. And I believe that they've been informed why, probably by these entities. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Okay, Ali's next question is, have you noticed the rise in the I am movement? 
Kanye West, Lady Gaga, Beyonce, I Am Sasha Force, uh, Watch Your Altar, and I Am Jazz, uh, J. Seuss Charlie, I don't even know who a lot of these are, Oprah promoting Joel Osteen's I yeah. Am Sermon. Yeah. I researched it. The I Am movement came straight from Blavatsky Theosophy. Yeah. Ali is absolutely right. And um, Joel Osteen's new book is full of this stuff. And um, you're spot on. Okay, next question. How is all this knowledge about alien technology and giants going to help us in the end times? Well, I'll just say that in the book of Enoch, it begins in the first chapter saying that it is a book that is for God's people in the end time tribulation. And in the book of Enoch, it specifically lays out that the fallen angels communicated these things. And as we come in to the day we live in, when we see the things with transhumanism and uh, space that's going on and the lies, this gives reassurance to people that want to believe the word of God for just what it says, that this is indeed a lie and a very ancient lie that is being per perpetuated and uh, forced upon us and that we can take heart and we can believe the word of God against the deceptions that we see in science falsely so-called and in the many areas that it comes at us and the more we embrace the word of god the more we're going to have understanding uh, the book of proverbs it talks about three things knowledge wisdom and understanding and we are beginning to get understanding as we study these things and seek out answers. And by the way, if you're uh, were criticized for even exploring these topics, um, but if you don't get our attempts to understand this biblically, uh, you're going to go to ancient aliens and you're going to hear that all of the things we talked about this afternoon, that it's because the aliens did it. And by the way, the aliens are coming back and they're going to give you a little DNA upgrade. So, you know, it's very important that uh, we understand these things, and um, I'm just so thankful that uh, John done such a good job tonight bringing these things out. And uh, great topic, great, great topic. Very, very important, very timely. And I would say something, mirror what you said about taking the Bible literally. If you take the Bible literally, and you uh, you take it and you just hang on the word it says, it's literal what it means, you will not be deceived and that is so important you will not be deceived by any deception that comes forth whether it be the giant alien deception whether it be the earth deception uh, whether it's the idea that uh, certain prophecies or you know have already taken place if you take all those prophecies literally and see what they actually say and what all has to go in together with them you will not be fooled so that's, you know, mine and David's, I think, battle cry, take the Bible literally. And I know we've been criticized by that, for that, by many um, teachers, researchers, pastors, all that for taking, because there's a big movement right now uh, to discourage people from taking the Bible literally. And um, so... Take it literally. Take a Bible literally. And I would say read the book of Enoch, too, because reading the book of Enoch will help guard you against any um, deception coming our way as well. And I have been called a reductionist. <laughs> and that's basically <laughs> what that means. Someone that's going to take the Bible for just what it says. And the reason why people will gravitate toward reductionism is because they cannot equate what the Word of God says with what modern scientists are saying. And I'll just have to say, I'm going to have to be a reductionist. And I, uh, I think we're at a point in time where uh, we need the same battle cry that the Reformers had. The battle cry of the Reformation was sola scriptura, scripture 
only. And that's my battle cry in these last days. If we stick to scripture and scripture only in evaluating the world around us, uh, whether it be spiritual deceptions from doctrine or from science or whatever, we're going to be all right, and we're not going to be deceived. Everyone that's going to deceive you in whatever area, they've got to get you out of the Word of God from really believing what it says. And uh, this is what Satan said. Did God really say, you know, did God really say that, Eve? Well, yeah, God really said that, and uh, we're really going to believe it. And it's so important to emphasize that uh, sola scriptura. That's amen, okay. amen. We only have about four more questions, but I did want to say that the creator of the universe wrote this book to guide us, and he knows the beginning from the end, and we need to pay attention to it, just like you guys said. Amen. Um, a question from Christopher. Um, if famous scientists have progressed mankind through the help of forbidden knowledge, was mankind meant to become as advanced as we are now? I think originally no, because uh, we were made perfect and we were made immortal, uh, but this knowledge of good and evil came along um, and we automatically knew right from wrong. We knew things that we weren't supposed to know. Um, but if this information was not supposed to be known, it would not be known. Um, Yahweh would put an end to it. Um, whether or not we're supposed to be practitioners of it is a different thing. I don't think we're supposed to be pra doing, doing the yoga, doing all these different things that come from these texts. But I think that mankind is um, supposed to know these things because uh, in the end, Yahweh is in control. And this is this is what... Uh, the end times is leading to, you know, and so he broke up Babylon for the first time for uh, getting this knowledge. We, I believe Nimrod was actually um, made himself a giant by means of technology of sorts. I mean, you, today you look at people with human growth hormones that are making themselves as an adult, injecting this stuff into themselves to make themselves taller, bigger. Uh, bigger feet, bigger hands, bigger head, everything. This is this is growing people. So, you know, if there's that technology now, I would imagine somebody like Nimrod who actually had these things passed down to him um, probably had something along those lines to do this. But the Bible says that they had this knowledge and that as if he didn't break them up, anything would be possible to them. And so Yahweh knows what's going on. And he will put an end to this eventually. But um, I guess to answer the question, should we know these things or should we be a part of these things? Originally, no. We were made to worship God and to obey his word and to live forever in harmony. Uh, but we've fallen a long way from that path. Okay, you kind of hit on the next question. Well, let me, can I just say yes. just a little bit here? Um, in Genesis 9 and 1, it says, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth. And instead of going forth to replenish the earth, they begin in rebellion to gather forth and build cities. And of course, the Tower of Babel uh, was the consequence of this. And just in my lifetime, I know when I was a child in uh, grade school, we heated our home with coal stoves and we had a coal shed and after school I would take the coal buckets and go down and get coal to come up and uh, for our coal stoves. But it was such a simpler and such a much better life and you just go back uh, farther than that in American history and the more simple and the more country, if you will, the life was, the more pure and the more and the better and the richer the life was. And with all of this technology, there seems to be this sin of the city life that comes with it. And there's just something about that that uh, is just not right. And you can't say that um, it's bad to have... Um, 
some of the things we enjoy, but yet there's definitely a downside to it that's undeniable. Yeah, like my Facebook app, there's a downside to that. I'm deleting it off my phone so I don't take home negativity with me to my house, man. I, uh, you know, just in the last few days, I've been getting hit really, really extremely hard by a lot of people. And um, I've just told myself I'm not bringing this home. I'm going to not have this app. Even though it's a great app to have, it's great to be able to keep up with people. It's great to be able to communicate, um, whatever. But not all technology is great. I mean, I can't wait to the day to where I can sit my phone down for one week and not have anything to do with it for a whole week. Um, <laughs> that's right. I believe that, David, right on. It's technology is great. Industry, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you touched a little bit on George's question. Um, it says, uh, if we have the time, uh, how does the technological technological advancements given from the spirits relate to the father saying, whatever they imagine will not be held from them at the Tower of Babel? So, um, yeah, I think I, I think I kind of went on that. I mean, it definitely relates to that. And, and the reason that, I mean, these, this, you got to understand, these are divine secrets that, that these aren't just, I mean, people think of technology as nothing or whatever, but technology is divine secrets that um, I believe that angelic beings use. When you see UFO crafts, you see these, and David's talked a little bit about these, these flying angelic beings and all these different things. These, these ideas are things that are used by the angels. I, th I believe Yahweh obviously has the final say. I mean, he can speak things into existence, but technology is not it is not to be taken lightly. I mean, it talks in the, in the book of Enoch, it, they taught them the secrets of, of the heavenlies. They, they taught these secrets. So, um, yeah. I believe we always have to remember that life is a battle between good and evil. And even though there's some technology that's good, there's also a lot of evil that sneaks in there. Um, okay, Paul has a question. Um, Jasher, chapter 66 and 67. Is this our guide, Job, from the book of Job? Job counseling Pharaoh against the Hebrews. I don't know if David's got his book of Jasher handy. I don't. I um, don't have that at my fingertips. I got it on the computer, but I'd have to click over here. Um, I've, I've read it, but I don't know. I mean, it's possible, but I, but I, um, I doubt that Job would be counseling Pharaoh against the Hebrews. Uh, but considering Job was very highly esteemed by Yahweh, uh, I couldn't imagine that. But um, I remember reading that and thinking the same thing. But I, I, you know, just judging by the character of Job, um, in what we see in Scripture in the Book of Job, I. I can't imagine him doing that, uh, counseling Pharaoh against the Hebrews. And I believe Job is more ancient than Pharaoh, um, the Pharaoh that we see in Exodus anyway. I believe he is definitely pre-flood. Um, and, and if he's not pre-flood, he's still as ancient as Abraham, in my opinion, because we see these um, behemoth and entities along those lines that, um, you know, died out around you know, I don't know exactly when they died out, but I don't know. Uh, David probably, David's in a lot more studying Job than I am. I'm going to refer to him. Well, I agree, and I have done um, a couple teachings on Now You See TV about my idea of the book of Job being antediluvian, which I believe I made a very strong case for. Of course, I would believe that, though, wouldn't I? And we <laughs> probably, um, Probably there's six teachings on FOJC YouTube about antediluvian Job. And uh, I, I believe that certainly Job was antediluvian and that the book was certainly uh, antediluvian and perhaps uh, recopied uh, later. But uh, yeah, absolutely. So I wouldn't equate uh, at all the biblical character of Job with the um, favor of the Exodus. Okay. Um, one comment to go, but one uh, little question here. And Gigi wants to say that we're doing a great job, as always. So Is um, that our Gigi? Yes, that's our All Gigi. right. Well, a shout out to you, Gigi. 
God bless you for staying up this late. And here's the question. Say hello to Chris. <laughs> here's the question. The book of Enoch calls Adam the first man that God created. What were the entities before Genesis 1 called? Well, the word Adam is the Hebrew word Adam, which basically means man. Um, and I'm not going to get into this whole idea of mine of uh, and I don't necessarily believe in the pre-Adamite race but I do believe that there was a race of human beings that coincided with the beings Adam and Eve that we know that were inside the garden and uh, um, but Adam means man it doesn't mean it's not a proper name um, and I believe in context with the one that was mentioned in the garden uh, you could use it as a proper name but um, Anyways, that's my take on that. I'm not going to go into a whole discussion on why I believe that, but I do would say one thing. I do not believe that incest was ever part of God's plan, and I believe it's always been against his law. And so the idea that incest had to happen to create all the families of the world, I think, is a wrong theory. And let's just leave it at that for me. Amen, John. And in um, when the Bible speaks of the first man, Adam, it's in relationship to the second uh, Adam, which was Jesus. And Adam is the head of mankind as we now know it. And Jesus, and where Adam failed, Christ succeeded. And I believe that in the very place where Adam fell, that this is the very place where Christ was tempted in the wilderness. And we were talking about this Judean wilderness in a very recent broadcast that John and I did and about the fallen powers that are said to be there, Lilith and the satire and uh, the habitations of devils. And um, where the first Adam failed, the second Adam succeeded. And I believe that the creation accounts in Genesis 1 and 2 that they're sequential not concurrent and that we have two creation events being described there and I also believe that before uh, in Genesis 1 2 that this talks about a destruction of a civilization that existed there and as I say this is why I like Graham Hancock because his work very much would be in lockstep with that. So this is indeed a very uh, fascinating and complex subject, but um, we'll have to leave that for another night. Okay, last but not least, Allie has a little joke. She's wondering if you, if uh, David and John will remember, she saw it in an archive, seeing any g nurks lately. I remember somebody saying that. Was that John or was that David that said Genark? So I remember that. That well, was pretty funny. Anyway, <laughs> that's the last, and we have past midnight. So, all right. Well, once again, we have taken you into the midnight hour, and um, I want to thank Sister Donna for doing the questions, and uh, I want to thank John for a tremendous job. Uh, John has not only uh, done an amazing job with Now You See TV and all that he's done, but he is really coming into his own as a researcher. And I just really compliment him on the things he's been bringing forth lately. And we want to also thank, as always, our Now You See TV listeners. You're just the best. We love you so much. And uh, you're the reason why we can get on here and do what we do and take it into midnight uh, every Saturday night. So God bless you all. And next Saturday night, we're going to be in Cleveland, Ohio. We're going to be at the conference there. And uh, if we're not too exhausted, uh, I tell you, these conferences are so exhausting. And I know the last Passover conference, we were going to do one, and we were so exhausted we couldn't. So if we're not too wore out, we just might do a midnight ride from Cleveland. Yeah, and hopefully the Internet situation will be worked out there and we'll be able to stream the conference as well. And so, and I just want to say, too, that be in prayer for everybody that's been hit with this hurricane, uh, from Hurricane Harvey to Irma, or is it Irma? So Irene, whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. And then 
yeah, Irma and then the one that's coming behind it, Jose, be in prayer for these people because it pretty much wiped out a couple islands like St. Thomas, and there's a lot of people that are suffering there. I know the mute news is mainly focused on Florida, but, uh, you know, Houston, all these little Caribbean islands that are being hit, be in prayer for these people because that's really the only hope that they have. There's no way uh, relief efforts will be able to touch all these people um, any other way. And so please be in prayer for those people. And one thing I want to say that I'm trying to really make a point to say is that if you have heard these things tonight and you think that this is something that hits home with you because maybe you've been rejected by the church over it and it's caused you to your faith to diminish or any, any other reason that you might be here tonight. Um, I've said this many times, there's no coincidences in the Hebrew language. You're here tonight for a reason and the only salvation comes in the Messiah and, and you, whether you call his name, Jesus, Yeshua, it doesn't matter. Salvation comes through him and through his atonement for our sins and he changed my life. I can tell you that right now. I used to be a yeah. drug dealer, a criminal, a drug addict, just a worthless human being all around. And in a moment, he touched me and changed my heart that was stone cold. I mean, just completely stone and just had no feelings for anybody or anything at the point and made me weep like a baby. Somebody hadn't cried since they were a kid and changed my life and i got the chance to start over it was and i can tell you right now that if i continued in the path i know exactly where that path would have led me because i see my friends that are on that path can that are still on that path some of them are either dead in prison or drug addicts and have no life whatsoever i mean their teeth are rotted out their skin and bones they're zombies and i so i see where my life would have led if i had not accepted them so you have a chance to start over and live through him. And he is your creator. He knows you. He knows what you're made to be. He knows everything about you. He created you for a reason. There's like from the last figures that I saw, just the idea of you being born on this earth. There's a one in billions and billions of chance that you are even here. Uh, the sperm connecting right with the eggs and you becoming the person that you are, there's a very small chance that you hear you could win the lottery five million times in a row and still not have the same amount of chance to be alive um, as you have right now. And you are here right now. You were made for a reason. And to find that reason and to know your creator, to know the one that loves you, the one that made you is the most important thing you can find in your life. You can, we can research all these subjects, find out all these mysteries, but if you don't know him and you don't have a relationship with him, then it's all worthless. It doesn't matter. And I just want to make sure I say that uh, before the end of the show, because I think it's very important. And David, thank you for the kind words, by the way. Well, and that is so well said, John, that's the most important question. Have you been born again? And God doesn't make clones. He makes disciples, and we want our listeners to search these things out for themselves. And as you search and um, allow the Word of God to be your guide, the revelations and the blessings will just flow. So thank you all Amen. so very much. It's time for the virtual high five, I guess. Virtual high five, guys. All right. Thank you guys so much, and we will see you again next week, uh, Tuesday. I think Jake's got a show with Isaac Stropes, um, which he was on here before, talking about uh, something to do with the Feast of Passover with Abraham or something along those lines. An interesting concept, some feast with Abraham, and he's Monte Juna's son-in-law, and he's going to be on with Jake again Tuesday. And then Wednesday, I don't believe we have a show. Um, I'm going to be taking – Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I'm going to be taking away from Now You See TV, away from my computer, away from my phone. Um, I will answer emails when it regards to people, if they have issues with their membership or anything like that, I will help take care of that. But I am going to take a family 
three day family time. I need it desperately. I need to get away from all this for just a few days to keep my sanity. As you can tell, I probably look a little insane right now. My hair's not quite as crazy as it was this morning, but um, I, you know, it's time for me to step away for just a few days. And Jake's going to be doing Tuesday. He'll be helping with you guys and any other aspects that you need. And just all, as always, man, David, it's a blessing to be with you, man, to be able to know you and just to be able to do these shows with you and our listeners, the same with you, to be able to be in contact with you and know you. And um, it's a great blessing on our lives. So thank you guys. I consider myself most blessed.